This is a short tutorial on uh, electron microscopes. This features in the turning points in physics section of the AQA A2 level syllabus. Um, electron microscopes uh, are, fa are fairly complicated devices, basically used because there's a limitation of resolution um, with normal optical light. If you have normal optical light, as in from a, from a light bulb, it's of a particular frequency of a few hundred uh, nanometers. Um, the, that wavelength actually gives actually does limit your resolution. So for example, if you, um, if you want to see something that's smaller than a few hundred nanometers across, then visible light is probably not the uh, correct way to use to scan it. Um, it would be a bit like using um, be, be a bit like um, driving a, a spaceship over a city and scanning the city by throwing 10 meter wide uh, bouncing balls, at the various buildings, you wouldn't be able to discern um, the actual individual buildings very easily. Um, a good example of this, it's an experiment you can try at home, is if you go to the local DIY shops and you buy a red light and a daylight bulb that emits some uh, some blue some blue and violet light. Um, you could use the daylight bulb to uh, to illuminate a book with some very small print on it, and then stand as far away as you possibly can and still be able to read the text. On, in the book, then staying where you are, switch to the red light, and you'll find you won't be able to read the text because the uh, the, the red light photons um, wouldn't pr wouldn't produce the uh, correct level of resolution to produce um, a discernible image of of the text on your retina. So, in order to be able to see things that are even smaller, you have to use electrons, and uh, the resolution is therefore governed by the de Broglie wavelength of the uh, electrons. There are three types we're going to look at today. Uh, one is the um, one type is the tunneling, uh, sorry, the transmission electron microscope. The scanning electron microscope, although I'll be talking about this very briefly, it's not strictly in the syllabus, but I think it's useful to talk about. And the scanning tunneling electron microscope, and this one does feature quite frequently in turning points questions. Um, it's all about being able to see with electrons. The basic idea is that if you have a stream of electrons with a much shorter de Broglie wavelength than the wavelength of visible light, you'll be able to see to a greater resolution. Uh, so this is a transmission electron microscope. The electrons are produced at the top here by an electron gun. The magnetic condenser lens then uh, creates a collimated beam which goes through a thin sample. It's so thin here you can't actually see it and then the next magnetic objective lens then focuses the image then focuses the image from the object onto a first image and then the, the magnetic magnify lens does well, what it says on the tin really it makes the uh, image bigger the transmission electron microscope was invented was invented by Noll and Ruska in 1931 um, it uses the, these narrow beams of electrons in a vacuum tube because obviously you don't want it to interact with uh, air molecules and be scattered at all. Um, it, the thin beam goes through that thin sample. It either, the beam is either absorbed or scattered or transmitted. It's the transmitted electrons that will produce the image. Um, electrons from each point on the sample are focused by electromagnetic lenses uh, onto a fluorescent screen at the bottom, um, shown, shown at the bottom here, um, to form an enlarged image of the sample. The magnification depends upon the focusing power of the magnetic lens. The power of an electromagnetic lens can be adjusted simply in the same way as it would be with an ordinary microscope by altering the um, the, the electromagnetic current or by moving the actual magnifier lens itself. Um, this is very similar to an ordinary microscope if you think about it. If you've got a microscope with a, with a screen on as opposed to one with an eyepiece, um, you'd have your light source at the bottom here, the, here the electron source at the top. You've got your thin sample, it has to be thin to let, you know, to let the light through, in this case to let the electrons through. Then you have a series of lenses which then focuses an enlarged image onto, onto a screen. So it's very similar to, um, to a display microscope. Um, the lenses work by magnetic fields in the same way that a glass lens will refract and therefore bend the uh, the path of a light of a ray of light. The same thing happens with a magnetic lens, but obviously, just like with an ordinary lens, it doesn't do it perfectly. So there are what we call aberrations, uh, where it doesn't act like a perfect lens. 
so that does limit the resolution uh, available with the, the transmission electron microscope. Um, you're also limited by by the fact that you can only really see very very thin uh, very thin samples of material. So the sort of thing. So just to sort of remind you first of all how it works, you've got your electron source, you've got your condenser lens which makes a, which uh, condenses the ray, which condenses the ray as it goes through the sample where it's either where it's scattered and therefore not picked up, or it's absorbed and not picked up, or it's transmitted and therefore is picked up by the objective lens, which is similar to the objective lens on a microscope, on an optical microscope. You produce your first image here, and then your projector lens then then enlarges the image and produces a much more enlarged image um, on the on the fluorescent screen. The fluorescent screen is very similar to the uh, screen on the old cathode ray tube televisions. It's a similar sort of thing. Electrons hit it, there, and their kinetic energy is turned into light. Um, the so that is basically how they work. Just to summarise. So the first lens gathers electrons accelerated from the source and directs them towards the specimen. The focal length of the two other lenses then depends on the electron speed. Uh, for this reason, the specimen has to be cut significantly thin for all electrons to pass right through without any loss of energy. Um, the tunneling electron microscope, unlike a light microscope, um, the contrast is produced by scattering rather than by absorption. Uh, so heavier atoms in the specimen will scatter electrons through larger angles than light ones, removing them from the electron beam, which means the, um, the transmitted electrons from each point will then go on to form the image. So where you have a lot of scattering, you'll have a dark bit on the image, and where you have less scattering, you'll have a lighter um, part on the image. So that's fairly simple. Um, and, it's you, and it's first used really to look, at, to look at cells in much more detail than we have done before. So the resolution of the of the transmission electron microscope is, depends on the de Broglie wavelength of the electrons, um, but it's also limited by um, by lens aberrations as well. The scanning electron microscope I won't talk to, in too much detail about, but basically it works in a very similar way. Only instead of having instead of looking at what goes through, then we look at what's actually scattered off the actual specimen, and uh, and therefore we can build up an image. So the, these are the ones where people often often show electron microscope images because you can see to a much higher level of resolution. So this is, for example, the uh, the hole in a CD, um, Velcro. Well, you might wonder what that is. Well, it's the eye from um, from some sort of insect type critter, um, like that one perhaps, uh, or that one. And it basically works. A, a bit like a camera, uh, only instead of having a source of light, it has a, it has a very finely tuned source of electrons. Of course, that is the other uh, limiting factor with a transmission electron microscope, that the electron gun will will not just produce electrons of one particular energy. It won't be completely monochromatic, and therefore the lenses won't work in quite the same way for the different speeds of electrons. The um, scanning tunneling microscope was invented in 1981 by by uh, Gerd Binning. Binnig and Heinrich Röhr. It uses quantum behaviour of electrons used to actually build up an image. The idea is very, very simple. If you have a very, very small gap, and here this gap is very, very small, the fine tip of this needle is about one atom thick, um, just to give you an idea of the kind of sizes, the electrons can actually jump, can actually quantum tunnel from the surface to the tip, and it can also quantum tunnel from the tip to the surface, and it's doing it all the time. But if you put a very small voltage across that, so you make this one positive, for example, you, you make the tip positive, electrons will be able to quantum tunnel to the tip, but fewer of them will quantum tunnel back from the tip because of the um, because of the forces in because of the work that has to be done in order for them to do that. So, as the electrons quantum tunnel from the surface to the tip, you'll get a very very small current which can be picked up by a picoammeter. Now, the way this works, there are two ways that, 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 that this can work. This tip could move quite happily across the surface. So when it's far away from the surface, the probability of the electrons quantum tunneling to the tip is quite low. So the, so the ammeter read, the picoammeter reading is much lower. And when the tip moves across an area, I've lost my pointer. When the tip, when the, uh, tip moves across an area um, where the surface is close to the tip, then the probability that the electrons will quantum tunnel to the tip 
increases, thereby increasing the image of the picoammeter, uh, increasing the current, sorry, to the picoammeter. The motion can be very finely um, adjusted and measured using piezoelectric sensors. As you apply pressure to those piezoelectric sensors, a uh, very high voltage can be set up um, and therefore you can very, very precisely know the position of, of that tip. So that tip just basically moves moves across the surface and it moves across in line and it moves down in, 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 in lines and it can actually take that measurement as it goes across. Now this is possibly one of the uh, this is possibly one of the highest resolution microscopes in existence. You can actually see individual atoms and in fact I'm almost ashamed to say I'm old enough that I can remember when this was actually on tomorrow's on a program called Tomorrow's World when they were you know, showcasing new inventions they showcased this as a as, as a brand new invention. And it's the first time we've ever been able to see individual atoms. So on the image you can see on the right there, that is a, a thin sample of a material and those are the atoms on the surface of it. Um, so with, a, with the scanning tunneling microscope you can actually see down to that particular, um, down, down to that resolution. And that's why they're, they're very important. So whenever you see uh, clever things being done by uh, various uh, people at, at uh, a variety of top universities where they'll show, where they'll where they'll write they'll write the name of the university in, in individual atoms. That image is taken with a scanning tunneling electron microscope. I hope that's helped. Um, that's the basic overview of how electron microscopes work.